Okay, so now we have uh, we'll have our last panel. Uh, it's about observed malicious cyber criminality during COVID in the African and Arab uh, regions. We have expert uh, experts from different regions that they will share their experiences and discuss at, at attack trend updates, see sort observations, new tendencies, and malicious and cyber criminality during COVID. So I will start with. Uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Hakim uh, Adijola, he is here. Abdul Hakim, you are here. So, Abdul Hakim, I don't know if all the uh, panelists are with me. He's here. Okay, great. So, okay. So, yes. Abdul Hi. Hi. So, hi, Abdul Hakim, hi, how are you? Abdul Hakim has several leadership positions. I'll, I will not list all of them. I, I will just say that he is the chair of African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group, chair of working group on cyber incident management and critical information protection, and chair of Nigerian National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy Review. Uh, and finally, uh, he is a Nigerian Computer Society, uh, National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy Review Committee. Okay, so uh, it's over to you, Abdul Hakim. You will share with us your perspectives about the observed militias during COVID-19. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Wafa. Uh, first of all, let me uh, fully and wholeheartedly agree with uh, something Chris just said. Uh, we are actually uh, protecting our communities, not just simply protecting uh, computers. Now, um, early this year, uh, the Kenyan uh, CSERT uh, Coordination Center indicated that between July and September 2020, it detected 3. I mean, 35.2 million uh, cyber threat events, uh, which was, uh, and that was just in the quarter of uh, July to September 2020. Uh, which was a 152.9% increase from the previous uh, quarter. Uh, and, and this was accompanied by you know, uh, a commensurate increase in malware and web application attacks. They attributed this uh, to the uptake of e-commerce and to the COVID pandemic. Uh, the attackers tended to uh, target remote working systems and uh, e-commerce you know, tools and sites. Uh, Having said that, clearly um, other statistics have shown that South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria tend to be, have been the most affected in terms of quantum uh, across Africa. Indeed, in Nigeria, the Nigerian Central Bank warned of a spike in phishing attacks, uh, mal malicious spam and ransomware uh, you know, related attacks. And these, these attacks tended to have messages, for example, from health organizations like the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, or even the World Health Organization itself. And so they were using coronavirus as a bait to impersonate brands, uh, circulate, unfortunately, disinformation, uh, thereby misleading customers and employees. And so in some cases, uh, they were able to spoof the, you know, uh, the registration process to collect government aid or even aid uh, you know, from uh, re relief agencies, uh, packages from relief agencies. And in other cases, we've seen where cyber criminals endeavor to collect victims' information, uh, things like account details and the like, under the guise of a likely transfer of relief funds. Um, <clears throat> on 2nd of September, 2020, the Nigerian Economic and Financial Crimes Commission operatives arrested at least 13 suspects believed to be members of an organized criminal uh, syndicate who uh, specialized in defrauding victims, you know, of a lot of money, millions of Naira. And though the workings of these groups as networks or connected individuals are not very clear uh, because it's still being probed by the security operatives. Uh, that said, uh, we've seen instances where criminals impersonate bank staff and advise victims to download mobile apps, ostensibly to ease their banking needs, including loans during this uh, trying uh, period related to COVID. Uh, and the truth of the matter is I think end users really need to be careful, check their emails, even their phone calls that they're claiming to be from some of these uh, health organizations or government agencies, especially if the caller asks for bank information or you know, click on any link or website. 
Um, you know, also we know these basic cyber hygiene rules of avoid clicking attachments and emails, you know, that especially if they, they claim to have some kind of COVID-19 pandemic connotation. Uh, so we've seen, uh, you know, people downloading mobile apps from sources they're not sure about. And those apps have tended in some instances to contain uh, ransomware. We also have another Nigerian cybercrime group called Silver Terrier. Um, that the specifically targeted organizations and workers this time, not just the organization, but the workers responding to COVID-19. And I think one of the challenges <clears throat> that I personally have observed, and maybe this is something other countries can improve upon, is that sometimes even the names of these apps, especially by government organizations, are not really intuitive. <clears throat> For example, the app relating to the National Identity Management Commission um, which basically deals with, you know, national identity is called MWS. I mean, what does, M, M, you know, M as in Martha, W as in water, S as in streets. I mean, what does that have to do with identity management? And so, for example, the railway corporation in Nigeria, their app is called Secure Fair. But you see, you actually need within the names of the apps, preferably at the beginning, something that directly relates that app to uh, you know, the end user organization or, or agency. Um, but the CBN also says it's continued to monitor these uh, criminal activities. And again, um, I think it's very important that um, government agencies and private corporate establishments also monitor. However, um, while they are sending awareness and advocacy messages by phone and email to customers calling for caution in all online transactions and dealings. Uh, I think many of us, especially in, 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 in public bureaucracy, don't appreciate that many of the legitimate recipients are functionally illiterate. And thus, you know, such messaging media really needs to be uh, fully considered or in this case, recon reconsidered because there's no need sending a slew of advocacy or positive messages advising uh, people who inherently, it's not that they can't read at all, but they can't read very well, especially uh, the lingua franca English. Uh, so having said that, we do need to en uh, engender partnerships between government and the private sector to address some of these problems. Uh, because one of the challenges we have is that if response mechanisms are do dominated by security agencies, then of course there are concerns that will be raised about uh, issues relating to abuse, accountability, uh, access to information, as well as the obligations of even the commercial sector players to report attacks. If they feel government is everything, then they may feel there's nothing that they need to do and thereby, quote unquote, save you know, their money. Um, and so sometimes this may cause a reluctance to report offenses and the continuation of the perpetuation of behavior that increases all of our vulnerability to cybercrime. One of the ways forward, I think, is also to um, invest in joint task forces to build confidence between public and private sector. And, and I think this is a, a, a very uh, preferable option we should look at because effective collaboration between, for example, financial institutions, uh, corporates in Nigeria, we have the cyber, Crime Advisory Council would be a practical step because it builds the multi-stakeholder um, ecosystem that you know I've heard discussed by some of the previous uh, speakers in in, in, uh, in other sessions. The issue, though, is that we do need to achieve a positive balance between protection of privacy and then the need enforcement. Uh, bottom line, uh, or rather, really in addressing the challenges. Um, of remote workforces during pandemic, anticipated the pandemic in the first place, nor did any of us really uh, uh, anticipate that we would live and continue to live with the situation for so long. Um, so a hybrid approach, I think, would be very useful to all of us. Um, we have the challenge of uh, managing on-premise systems remotely, uh, we do need to ensure that mobile device management has two-factor authentication, you know, to access uh, uh, as a default. 
uh, we have to um, you know, deal with distributed uh, denial of services. So those solutions must be in place. Uh, we need to be able to leverage managed service providers to increase resource capabilities and incident response. Because again, our communities, our, uh, our organizations do have uh, uh, insufficiency or lack of uh, you know, the right kind of resources. Uh, we also need to look at uh, adapting uh, the adoption of cloud-based options requiring wholesale change, uh, such as uh, extended detection and response, uh, because it becomes important, that becomes important as updates are pushed in from the cloud. Uh, so I've, I've uh, learned from some of our uh, African CISOs is that um, <laughs> for human error and foolishness, uh, we must build capabilities with this mindset, whether the threat stems from intentional, accidental, or part of a larger uh, conspiracy. Uh, cyber incident management demands continuous improvements uh, based on monitoring the important, what we would call our crown jewels or the important data. Uh, so we have to prioritize our data. Uh, remote worker systems are important and does play a, a crucial role. However, only it is only one component of a much wider uh, you know, cybersecurity uh, ecosystem. We must bear in mind that cyber criminals look and weigh the effort versus the gain and will always invariably take the cheaper way to, uh, you know, to carry out an exploit. Uh, threat intelligence and collaboration, as many of uh, the previous speakers have said, is key. We must continue to share uh, and increase the visibility of develop and develop cap capabilities. Um, our remote worker environment will vary in different locations, but we must understand that the remote worker environment is a tug of war, which requires options to mitigate threats without hampering underlying productivity. And in closing, I would want to say that institutions should continue to raise awareness among their customers on information security outside the office space. They need to build institutional capacity to deal with cybercrime and keep abreast uh, with the innovations uh, and, and the technology in general. Uh, we must enhance existing. Keep abreast uh, with the innovations uh, and in initiatives. And last but not least, we must always seek ways to protect the endpoints, which are our customers, regardless of their status or their level of enlightenment or education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abd Hakim, for sharing this information uh, from Nigeria and, and about the cybersecurity, observe, observed cybersecurity events. Um, and thank you also for the rec recommendations that you have given in the second part of your speech uh, to face these challenges. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to Tunisia uh, uh, and Tunisia uh, with Mohamed Ali bin Mabrouk. Uh, Mohamed Ali Mabrouk is uh, the head of uh, Watch, Alert and Warning Division in Tunisia. He has been working at Tunisia since uh, 2010 and he is passionate about open source tools. So, uh, Mohamed Ali, uh, it's, uh, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Fair. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you all for uh, participating to this uh, session today. So, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Ben Mabrouk Mohamed Ali, head of the Watch Alert and Warning Division of Tilsir. The subject of my presentation is about uh, observed uh, malicious activity observed by the TNCERT during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so my talk here is uh, relevant to those uh, of us who are cybersecurity experts, computer emergency response uh, team, and uh, decision makers. So uh, the content of my presentation, I will start in the introduction by explaining the reasons of hacking. Then I will talk about top observed malicious activities, and I will finish with a uh, conclusion. 
Uh, so uh, we know all that the main goal of hackers is to have an easy and fast way to get money using their skills in filtrating information systems. So uh, to reach uh, this main goal, they wait patiently for the right uh, opportunities. So uh, the corona pandemic represented a good opportunity for them. And this explained the rise of malicious cyber uh, activities in our countries in the world, especially uh, during the quarantine period. They are similar in terms of types and uh, methods, but the difference is uh, only in the number of occurrence from one country uh, to another. So uh, because of that, government in most countries in the world have resorted to quarantine, uh, quarantine to limit the spread of corona. This quarantine imposed on institution to adopt uh, remote work using VPN connection and organize remote meetings via, with the video conferencing solution. So working remotely using VPN imposed on internet uh, server providers an extra effort to provide secure uh, services and ensure its continuity for customers. Uh, we also fi uh, find a phishing operation for some employees who work in financial and sensitive institution in anticipating of using some safety measures when working remotely or not being well prepared to use VPN connection or use a video conference solution which has, uh, which has a zero day vulnerability or weakness like the example of Zoom in April 2020. <clears throat> so uh, in Tunisia, we found some malicious activity related to this and some hackers. It's his activity ont eu un impact. Uh, 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 some hackers threatened the ISP with DDoS attack and demand, uh, demanded a ransom in exchange for stopping this attack. So speak about uh, ransom DDoS, as you can see on, on this uh, slide. <clears throat> so uh, uh, as for the provision of health and financial aid, which was carried out by most of the government in the world, especially Tunisia, it was an important uh, driver of the, uh, of the hacker by provoking the group affected by corona and trying to steal their credential and personal data by social engineering, uh, phishing, uh, smishing attack, fake news, uh, fake Facebook wall, fake website, in order to threaten them and to publish their data if they did not pay the required ransom as soon as possible. So uh, the Tunisian government uh, depended on the La Poste Tunisienne company with the financial operation of those affected the, by the coronavirus. It was uh, constantly targeted with the, its customer by hackers to steal their credential. So let's now look at the next slide which show you what has, uh, what has been uh, passed and sorted by date from slide uh, six to 13. So as you can see, it is an event in mine of April 2020. Another one, uh, 11 April 2020. Next one, uh, 7 May 2020. So uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, this is a card, uh, the log file that uh, contain the uh, victim identifier. Yeah, 9 November 2020. So our, our investigation revealed that uh, Master Sina, not Madam Tian, smart team, there is the hacker implicated, involved in, uh, in these attacks. Another one, 30 uh, November 2020. The same uh, method and technique, phishing, smishing, uh, uh, fake uh, web page, fake uh, Facebook uh, message. <clears throat> okay, uh, last one. So uh, we have 120 victims in less than uh, uh, 24 hours. So uh, also customer of major uh, telecom operator in Tunisia have been targeted by fake news and phishing attacks via Facebook pages controlled by hackers to entice uh, them to uh, participate 
in uh, falsified computation to win a limited connection. This is an example. So uh, in addition, we do not forget vulnerabilities exploitation in the information system of some sensitive institution and the installation of some malware uh, like ransomware, web shell, botnets, and advances uh, persist uh, persistent threats in their private network, especially uh, the exploitation of the vulner vulnerability of uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Exchange. So uh, to reduce the number of affected Microsoft Exchange servers, uh, servers uh, to insert for load of process to assist all the affected uh, establishment. So banks, government, pre presidency of the public, private companies, hotels. So um, uh, multi multiple servers have been compromised with the uh, web shield. So uh, there is some uh, malware uh, installed uh, after the exploitation of uh, uh, the vulnerability of Microsoft Exchange, uh, I mean X, Lemon, uh, Lemon Dark, uh, Shopper, uh, FDHA. So this is an SP web shell. Uh, okay. Here are some malware that uh, have been the investigation. So th there is a web shell uh, detected by the semantic and, uh, and code protection in uh, victim uh, institution. So uh, as uh, just to summarize the main point of my talk, uh, the number of uh, incidents handled by Twinsert in 2020 was increased uh, three times more than the previous one due to malicious activities during the COVID-19 quarantine. So uh, all groups like cybersecurity experts, legal experts, government and social workers must uh, work together in order to find the appropriate solution to avoid or to reduce hacking attempts during disaster or during a severe time. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, that's all, Madam Afia, uh, over to you. Thank you, Mohamed Ali, for your informative, very informative and detailed uh, presentation. Now let's go to Cote d'Ivoire with uh, Vladimir uh, Aman. Uh, Vladimir is the head of um, Cote d'Ivoire CERT. He has nearly 10 years of professional experience in the field of cybersecurity in Cote d'Ivoire. In addition, to the technical background acquired during the years spent as cybersecurity analyst at uh, the at the Code Divorce Cert and the platform for combating cybercrime. So, uh, Vladimir, uh, it's over to you. Hi, Waf. Uh, Vlad, unfortunately, has not made it yet. Ah, uh, okay. So, at least you introduced him. <laughs> then let's go to Amen with Dr. Amen, uh, with Dr. Haytham Al Hajri. Uh, uh, Dr. Haytham uh, is an executive cybersecurity specialist at Oman National CERT. Dr. Haytham Al uh, Haji holds a PhD in cybersecurity management and a master degree in digital forensics. Over to you, Dr. Haytham. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Watha, for the kind introduction. And um, actually been listening to you uh, most of the time and um, we are kind of in the same bin. Uh, we've been experiencing uh, the same things um, uh, technically with Africa and with Europe and with Americas as well. Uh, the pandemic actually did, um, uh, was an eye opener as well for most of us. And uh, it's clearly have shown us a message as well. Um, I wanna talk from perspective of certs and what have certs uh, felt during the pandemic and what kind of detection that we have seen from the malicious activity, uh, whether it's around the globe or here within the Sultanate cyberspace. Um, actually, uh, as uh, Dr. Hakim Ajjola just mentioned earlier, that as a society, um, mostly has got affected by different kinds of categories. So I'll, I'll talk about, generally what happened with the society and then we'll go into uh, government or uh, companies and organization. The society during the pandemic was hit with very crafted uh, kind of social engineering, uh, identity theft, uh, a lot of the usual that has been mentioned earlier. 
with emphasis on ransomware and intelligence gathering. So we have noticed that a lot of impersonation, uh, identity theft of uh, World Organization Health Center or uh, the CDC here in the Sultanate, as well uh, with different uh, versions of uh, an infectious map that has been uh, trying to uh, be spreading around the application, especially mobile phones, where it tells you download this infection uh, map that will show you who's getting infected around you and give you alerts. And also will give you indication how many uh, people are infected with the COVID-19 uh, during the pandemic uh, from 2020 until today. Uh, there are a couple of those applications which are a malicious application that uh, gain a root access to your device and then they aim into financial uh, kind of credentials in the mobile itself or in the uh, systems uh, at general. Uh, the importance, I want to emphasize that the specially crafted malware and malicious activity that has been targeting the society, as us members of the society as well, who works in different kind of categories, whether it's in law enforcement or critical infrastructure, national infrastructure, or government agencies, they can also get hit either with that malicious application or a family member who can get uh, who, who got that uh, infectious application, uh, for example, a ransomware, and then spreads through the network. Now, unfortunately, during the pandemic, um, small to uh, medium kind of entrepreneurship uh, programs, or let's say companies have uh, mostly suffered. Why? Because of their weak infrastructure, they were not able or they were not ready for a sudden transformation, whether they are aiming to provide their services online through the uh, sales uh, within the e-commerce system, uh, let's say transforming the business module or actually accommodating a large number of staff and employees working remotely. Now, the factor that as CERT, we have noticed that once we deployed uh, a lot of remote uh, working remotely from home, they are start to get targeted in a different way. Uh, perhaps when the infrastructure team or uh, let's say the support team within the organization can better save the employees from different kinds of attack because of the infrastructure, how it's set up, the antivirus and so on. But once uh, the employee has taken, for example, his machine, his laptop or his desktop or anything, working from home, then he's subject to a different kind of uh, atmosphere or infrastructure, whether he's using a free Wi-Fi, maybe somebody else is joining that Wi-Fi. Uh, some people are um, uh, family members who get their phones or devices infected in the same network. So the network of the organization has been compromised uh, at home. And that's a different level. So as a search, we start observing all kinds of malicious activity that are happening either at home or, or, or actually targeting people at work at the infrastructure. So we are started initiating kind of a guideline. If you are working at home, you need to have a separate kind of network. If you are working at home, you need to ensure that you are activating antivirus, you are updating yourself using a proxy. Uh, you're making sure that uh, you are in a network alone. Uh, send of a guideline how to operate during uh, the pandemic or working remotely. Now, uh, what kind of top malicious activities that we have seen is social engineering and uh, also uh, ransomware. Ransomware was really huge uh, impact on a lot of organization. Uh, a lot of data has been lost. Uh, but again, uh, we learning fast in a curve as well. Uh, the thing is that I want to mention, uh, as a society as well, that like we're trying to protect ourselves inside the society, as uh, mentioned today earlier, uh, once we are trying to achieve that level of security or that level of awareness where people are not supposed to click in malicious link or they must identify that sharing, oversharing of information through social media and getting the information from the right places, whether we can see that a lot of uh, heat maps or infection maps that have been spreading around, they are pretending to be an official one from the World uh, Health Organization or from the CDC. Uh, they start uh, rolling out vaccines, and then again, the shift paradigm has shifted. Now they are focusing on people saying, hey, get registered in the vaccine or financial aid uh, during the pandemic. A lot of people have lost their work, uh, lost their job. So there is a different kind of scheme that happened where people say, well, the government is allocating this much funds. Uh, if you are interested or you are affected, please fill in this information. Unfortunately, people are oversharing their information. They share their uh, sensitive information. Some people went to the extent that they are sharing uh, banking uh, or financial information along with OTP. For some reason, they believe that the OTP will be a 
type of verification where they can verify they are receiving the money, but unfortunately they were scamming them in there. So as CERT or the national CERT at that level, we have uh, started giving a lot of awareness. Uh, we started spreading the news. We start hitting in different multiple uh, attitude. We, we are being active in social media. We are being active in the radio. Uh, we are being active even in TV. Uh, directing people that you should get the resources from the right places you should get the numbers and you should not overshare your information and especially sharing the links from unknown sources claiming to be a fund area or a trying or claiming to be an official site that they are trying to get financial aid and so on so at that perspective and i know it's been a long day and uh, i just trying to avoid a lot of the talks that has been uh, already been shared and overshared here in the platform. Uh, so yeah, from that perspective, I would like to end uh, my uh, short and brief uh, uh, status on the infectious health happening during the COVID-19 pandemic and the malicious activity that happened targeting society at first and then targeting the critical infrastructure or the government infrastructure at all. Back at you, Afa. Thank you, Dr. Aitan. Thank you very much. Yes, you, you said an interesting thing. Uh, many, many cybersecurity events uh, were because uh, we had to switch online uh, on non-planned, with the non-planned and programmed processes. So we had to face many challenges. Thank you. Thanks, thanks again. Now uh, I will go to um, hear some features from a global, uh, global organization from ICANN uh, with uh, Carlos Alvarez. Carlos uh, leads ICANN's, ICANN's engagement with the, with the trust and public safety communities. ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and he will speak about DNS, TR, uh, TICR project. T, uh, T, uh, DNS TICR stands for Domain Name Sec Security Threat Information Collection and Reporting. So uh, it's over to you, uh, Carlos. Thank you, Alva. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for staying with us, even though we're running a little late. Yes. Um, so, yeah, like Wafa said, I lead ICANN's engagement with, the, in general, law enforcement, be it criminal or civil as well as with all the different flavors within the cybersecurity industry. That includes incident response, threat intelligence, operational security, et cetera. The, the topic that I want to speak with all of you for a few minutes is um, the project that we started at the beginning of the pandemic that we called DNS Ticker. Um, that stands, as Wafa said, for Domain Name Security Threat Identification Collection and Reporting. In March of last year, um, like many others, we realized that we had to do something to look into what the bad guys were doing with or in the domain name space. Um, we were seeing left and right all sorts of reports, some claiming that um, that the world was falling apart because they malicious actors everywhere were registering thousands and thousands of domains to conduct all sorts of different malicious activity. Um, so we started a project. What it does is that it pulls all the zone files for all the generic top level domains. That means all the, um, the TLDs that are not country codes. So remember that there are generic top level domains and there are country code top level domains. The country codes have only two characters at the right of the last dot. Some examples are .de, .se, .ru, .at. Anything that has three or more characters is a generic top level domain. So we download um, and analyze all those corresponding to uh, TLDs with three or more characters. And we analyze them. We look into all the zone files, um, trying to find hits from a dictionary of words that are related to the pandemic. Um, that dictionary of words includes tens, of words in different scripts, not only in Latin script. Mm. 
And we, of course, recently updated it to include Omicron related, Omicron, uh, not Omni, but Omicron uh, related um, terms um, since the beginning. And even though we started in March, we did the analysis going back to January of 2020, um, just to see if anything had, hap had happened as the world was realizing that, th that, that something was coming in January of 2020. We identify the domains that have anything to do with terms related to the pandemic, and we verify them against uh, some intel sources that we think um, are probably the best for this purpose that we could find. Virus Total Fish Tank, Alien Vault OTX, and Google Safe Browsing. The domains may or may not get hits, meaning a domain that we see as having any relation to a pandemic term may come back with a report. Maybe virus total says something about that domain or maybe Google safe browsing says something about that domain. We then have a human, um, check the actual report that we get back that analyst um, not only looks at that report but carries on several other manual steps and only if he has 100% certainty that the domain is not only malicious but within ICANN scope then that domain gets reported with evidence to the registrar with which the domain was created. For us as coordinators of the technical functioning of the DNS, uh, we have the must that we have to avoid false positives. We can't allow ourselves to report as malicious domains that are not. And we have the obligation to increase trust among registrars and registries. The registries being the operators of the top level domains and the registrars in our world, in the GTLD space, the registrars being the companies that sell the domains to the public. After all this time, we have some numbers here. And it, it's interesting to see, remembering that ICANN's remit is, is narrow. Um, the project was scoped specifically to address phishing and malware domains, nothing else. We can't look or act on domains used for fraud or scams. Um, it's very specific because our scope coming from our bylaws are to help coordinate the technical functioning of the domain name system globally. Um, and we have to help ensure that it stays secure and, and resilient. So this excludes content. Um, and that leaves out many of the things that, that many others may have been investigating. Since January of 2020 to this month, we have identified almost 360,000 pandemic related domains that includes both legitimate and malicious domains. That's the total universe of pandemic related domains that according to our dictionary have been created within the entire GTLD universe. Now from May of 2020 to August of this year, the number that we detected was 200, almost 247,000 of pandemic related domains of which only 6.1 domains came back with a report from Virus Total or Google Safe Browse or OTX. So we have basically 15,000 of the 247,000 uh, pandemic related domains that we identified as having at least one report. And not only that, that had one report, but also that had name servers and were resolving to an IP address, meaning they were operational. 
of this, um, our analyst considered that only 4,400 had received high confidence reports. The other 10,000 and something, um, the reports received for those 10,000 plus other domains were not of enough confidence for him to continue looking into. Remember that, for example, VirusTotal is a collection of engines. And some of the engines used in VirusTotal are worthy of, of, of let, let's say it in, in a very informal way, are worthy of a whole lot of trust, while some of those engines, other uh, among those engines, you may not be able to trust their results as much. I'm not gonna name names. Um, that's not the purpose. Um, and of those 4,400, because of our scope, um, we could only flag as malicious and within our scope, 370 domains, which is far different from what was reported or what has been reported in the media frequently that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of domains. Remember that caveat, that we don't look at fraud, we don't look at scams. That's where the bulk of the domains related to the pandemic were being created. And that, that to me, that, that's what explains the difference in the numbers that we report. Um, if you look at the reports that Interpol has put out, or uh, Palo Alto, now you will see that they have very specific information with tens of thousands of domains. Yeah, they can include, and they do include, and they should include because it's within their scope, domains that have been used to sell counterfeit masks, to sell um, miracle cures. We can't look at that. That's content. That's outside our scope, we would violate, we would be in breach of our bylaws if we, if we looked into that. So staying within malware and phishing in the universe of pandemic related domains, 370 malicious domains. And we reported them to the registrars and they were acted on. Um, unfortunately, the project um, is not focused on any particular region. We don't look at this on a per region basis. We, we could, we have not done it, but we could probably um, look, for example, at where the ESs are located. If, if we see a malicious domain, we could try to group them on a periodical basis and try to see what's there uh, territorial connection where the AS for each domain is located and then try to come up with match over time. Um, we could also see where the registrars are located um, just to try to enrich the public reporting on the project, but we are not doing so at the moment. Um, for now, the, the priority for us is expanding the scope of the project. Um, but this is a process, everything within ICANN has to follow a process. We are following that process um, and um, we are seeking input and we are in discussions with, for example, the governmental advisory committee um, so that they can um, share with ICANN uh, how the scope of this project should be expanded. What other types of malicious activity or what, what other kinds of events could be analyzed through this project, through this tool, the DNS ticker. We'll see where it goes, but the tool is there, it works, it's effective, um, and it's accurate. So um, that's what I have for now. Thank you so much for your attention, and Wafa, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for interesting presentation and the information that you have shared with us. Personally, I know that within ICANN during uh, this pandemic, um, a, lot and a lot of work has been done to protect the consumers from uh, the malicious uh, domain names. Uh, so it was our last presentation in the panel. Uh, is there any question from the attendance?
I can't see any question. So everything was clear. So I think I have to close this panel. So I would like to thank you again, uh, thank all our distinguished panel, panelists for uh, what you have shared and presented. It was really very interesting. And uh, open. Uh,